Welcome to Policy Punchline. Here on the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives on frontier issues in our world today. I'm Princeton Senior Neil Reddy. Today, I'm very excited to speak with Ashoka Modi. Welcome, Professor Modi, and thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, thank you very much, Neil, for having me. So just a quick introduction. Professor Modi is a Charles and Marie Robertson Visiting Professor in International e- Economic Policy at the School of Public and International Affairs. After a long career as an economist at the World Bank and the IMF, where he served as Deputy Director of the Fund's Research and European Departments, Professor Modi came to Princeton to pursue research in international political economy. He has written extensively about topics like the European Union and international finance. But today we'll be discussing his newest book, India is Broken. So I I just want to get into sort of the process of writing this book, how you arrived at the thesis, and sort of how you went about pursuing that in the last couple of years. So could you just sort of outline that for our our listeners? Right. Uh, There is no real process. I've been thinking about India, you know, in some sense for a lifetime. I had really no intention of writing a book on India. And at some point, one of my alma maters, uh, the Center for Development Studies in Trivandrum, invited me to do a public lecture. So I gave a lecture on what I thought post-independence India had and had not achieved. And after I finished that lecture, I said to myself, you know, there's a book here. So I peddled a proposal and an Indian publisher picked it up very quickly and then soon after Stanford University picked it up and I started writing it. So it was, it it grew out of a sense that India always has promise. India has held promise for 75 years and there are many visible signs where that promise has been realized. But the international media and international authorities look at only the the most obvious achievements and they fail, in my view, to look at the problems that the vast majority of Indians still struggle with. And that's what I really wanted to write about. And I guess speaking to your, to your process and how you've written the book, it's, it sort of struck me as a very interdisciplinary book. You sort of use economics and economic analysis, but you've also talked frequently about political movements and social ideas that are prominent throughout India's history. Uh, for example, you highlight regional trends like the Shiv Sena and linguistic movements and also these sort of mass mobilizations of young men in, into politics and in often violent politics. Um, so why was it important to you to kind of have a holistic view of India's uh, history and economic history? So I never really thought of it that way. It's a very interesting question because when I sent it uh, the manuscript around for my friends to review, they asked me, why do you have politics over here? And it seemed to me the obvious thing. You really cannot explain economic policy without understanding the politics. And I quickly realized also that at some level politics is also not enough because underlying the politics is a broader set of social norms. And if if there was any intellectual development in this book, Uh, It is the crucial importance of social norms, which I can talk more about if you like, but the reason I felt that that had a resonance and a important implication is that when I finally arrived at the title India is Broken, more than anything else, I felt that way because I feel that this society has reached a point where cheating has become the norm in all walks of life. Uh, politics, economics, and social relations And I don't mean this just in a completely pejorative sense. This is often instinctive. 
and self-defense. I mean, for example, I dig a deeper well than my neighbor does because I'm afraid that he or she will suck up the groundwater. So the, the system has got set up in a way where you feel that you have to cheat or somebody's going to cheat you. And that that normative overlay you can see in all walks of society. And that is why I'm pessimistic. I do want to get into sort of this culture of corruption that you write extensively about. Um, and of course, that's a really prominent through line of how politics and, and economics intersect in, in India and also just some sociology. In the book, you could talk about the Praetorian society. So that's a term coined by Samuel Huntington and others before him. And you suggest it could kind of describe Indian political culture, like especially under Indira Gandhi. And so for our listeners, Huntington notes that a Praetorian society is one where mobilization has outrun institutionalization. So I'm wondering kind of where the institutions have failed in India's history, and particularly under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's time. And also, I just want to add, like, whether you think there's a, a top-down rule in this corruption, or is there levels where sort of the bottom feeds the top? Is, is it kind of a cyclical sort of phenomenon in India? Because obviously, I, I think your argument may suggest one over the other. Right. So there was a sense of political corruption or public corruption even at the dawn of uh, independence. This was very much in the form of public works uh, mainly where contracts were given for a consideration. Contracts were poorly executed. Uh, there were large margins uh, that that poor execution allowed people to to rake off the top. And then sometime during the Nehru years, uh, this corruption began to spread. It began to spread into institutions like colleges and schools. Principals of colleges had authority over purchasing uh, supplies or making appointments. And by the end of Nehru's rule, there was also a creeping corruption in the lower, lower parts of the judiciary. There was also, of course, the more well-known license permit raj that grew in that period, uh, which related to these absurd uh, import restrictions that came as a result of a misguided policy on uh, heavy industrialization, which brought in a flood of imports, and then unwilling to devalue the currency, they led to a mindless uh, import substitution regime. So there were several strands uh, of corruption by 1964, which are well documented in a parliamentary report in 1964, the Santanam Committee report. And Mrs. Gandhi, in a sense, inherited that regime. And it was a very critical point in, in Indian modern Indian history because Mrs. Gandhi had the option of trying to go back. It was not yet so ingrained that it was, it, it had, it was, it was not irreversible at that point. What Mrs. Gandhi did was she herself was utterly corrupt, partly through favoring her son in various activities and partly just because she personalized politics. The, so the, she made it clear that she was the person to elect and not the party. So distinguishing herself from the party began almost within months of her appointment as prime minister. That created this culture of branding and slogan-based uh, policies. And that then led to her mounting more expensive election campaigns. And then along with the fact that in 1969, in what they thought was a clever political move, 
to ban donations to political parties because they believed that the Swatantra Party at that time was receiving most of those corporate donations. Banning them would give reduce that disadvantage. That created just a f- flood of black money, unaccounted money, into politics, much of which Mrs. Gandhi then began to appropriate by virtue of the fact that she was the leader. <laughs> so that whole system then, it, Mrs. Gandhi is pivotal because that system then became irreversible. The incentives at, from that point on became such that it was in no one's interest to not do what she had done. And that's the bad equilibrium. Right. And you often use the term tunnel effect, like that that phenomenon to describe this equilibrium. Even at the lowest levels, as you mentioned, one person might dig a well deeper than the other just for fear of being taken advantage of, right? Right. Right. It's exactly that phenomenon. And the so, so the game theorists call it a bad equilibrium in the sense that if politician A is taking bribes and or is corrupt, how can I possibly not do the same? And so it becomes a ratcheting effect. I see. And I, I, I want to get into some, some of the earlier parts of his corruption and one one thought that I had, just as someone who, who's read about the the British colonial regime, is a lot of these tools that have been used by Indian politicians were actually, you know, long held by British colonial power. Like the Indian Constitution borrows a lot of verbiage from um, before um, partition. Uh, so I was wondering what your thoughts are on on the whole idea of inheriting a lot of the tools that you know might have eventually uh, fostered that sentiment that led Indira Gandhi to start the emergency, for example. So I have a somewhat strong view on this, which is that it is true that various parts of the Indian constitution and indeed many of the regulatory rules, especially with regard to the police services, Uh, With encounters, right? Well, even before we get to encounters, the preventive detention, uh, the sedition laws, they all hark back in various forms to the colonial period. But the fact that they hark back to the colonial period is a conscious post-independence decision. It is not something that, that... somehow by accident crept into the Indian post-independence administrative and judicial processes. It was a choice that they made. Okay, so they had the, 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 the maximum, you can say, as well. They had a clear example they could copy easily, but they chose to copy it. I don't, therefore, say that the you know, the, the colonial regime did many bad things, but the, the choice of a repressive, corrupt regime is one that uh, that Indian leaders chose for themselves. I see. Yeah, and I, I guess it's interesting in light of some of the economic decisions made by the Nehru administration, particularly in reaction to colonialism. Like, you see a lot of this sort of isolationist rhetoric in India that's often seen as a response to to colonialism. Um, So I'm I'm wondering how you think about that in terms of sort of the earlier days of heavy industry and and sort of establishing India as its own nation state through economic policy. Okay, so again, uh, I'll say it somewhat differently, okay? What is clear is that the immediate post-independence period was one of great optimism. I think up to about 1951-52, there was a sense of giddiness that we now have control over this country and we are going to, you know, transform it. And the Nehruvian vision was 
look, we have lost out on science and technology development for decades, if not centuries. And we need to access the vast global pool of science and technology and master it for the good of the country. Okay? That's, that's the Nehruvian vision. It's a reasonable vision. In fact, I would say it's a good vision. The difficulty is its translation into policy. And Nehru essentially decided that he wanted heavy industry. Now, again, people will rightly point out that there was a global sense at the time that what was at the time called the Big Push Industrialization, the name Big Push originating with uh, Paul Rosenstein Rodin, then at MIT, was, was the right way to go. Now, having said that, what is crucially important over there is, there are the, well, actually there are two crucially important things. That the more thoughtful advocates of heavy industrialization, the people that Nehru spoke to directly, and I know this because he has himself recorded it in his notes, said, okay, do heavy industrialization, but make sure that you do human capital investment. Make sure that you have some degree of safety net. But the crucial importance of education and health came as a part of the heavy industrialization package, even from a purely conceptual point of view. From an implementation point of view, the concern that the Reserve Bank even at the time raised and then the World Bank is that heavy industrialization is going to need a lot of imports. And imports, you don't have enough foreign exchange to pay for those imports. And so what you're going to end up doing is create a foreign exchange crisis. And at the same time, the big push will generate excessive demand for local goods and services and domestic inflation. I say this not in retrospect. I say this as a contemporary observer. At that time, these debates were ongoing. That we need more human capital and we need to be careful about the pace at, you, at which we do heavy industrialization. Nehru disregarded all of the above. He did not bother about the human capital. He, to his credit, he paid a lot of lip service to it. He would often speak about the crucial importance of human capital. And then he would shrug his shoulders and say, oh, well, you know, uh, we have all these expenses and we cannot really afford it. And he would dismiss it. And the same thing with the imports. Indeed, the second plan led almost instantly to a gush of imports and to a drainage of foreign exchange. And that's where the mistake occurred. Not in the concept, but not in not willing to take a deep breath and say, guys, this is not going well. We need to rethink the strategy. Right, and you write about the three five-year plans and how sort of it's kind of repeating the same mistake in, in quick succession, right? Correct. The third five-year plan was the big mistake because the second five-year plan had given not warning, not even ample warning, but bright red flashing warnings. Don't do this. And they just repeated it on a, on a larger scale. And that repetition was just purely historically contingent. It was the era of the Cold War. John Kennedy in the United States happened to be an enormous admirer of Jawaharlal Nehru personally. And Kennedy then soon became prime minister, uh, president. Indeed, in his, uh, if I remember right, 
in his, uh, one, I think in his inaugural speech, one of the or the st- one of the state early State of the Union speeches made reference to Nehru personally, and then he was active personally in lobbying the, the World Bank and other donor nations to give India money to sustain its heavy industrialization. And that's when this pattern of disregard for small industry, disregard for agriculture, disregard for education, human uh, health, for urban de- of a holistic urban development, all that became a part of the first 17 years. And then Mrs. Gandhi was too lazy to change any of that. Right. I mean, here at the podcast, we don't really get into hypotheticals, but I I will say that it's quite interesting that President Kennedy was running against Richard Nixon, who was perhaps not the biggest fan of India. And just to think about how, you know, perhaps there could have been a totally different outcome in terms of the lack of aid to India if Richard Nixon were were to be president, would the five-year plans have even continued it's it's quite interesting yes that's that's a not a, a not unreasonable hypothetical i mean richard nixon had a visceral dislike for for in, uh, india and you know i think i say in my book he used some extremely unpleasant language in with uh, with which he described some Indian leaders. Nixon was found out in any case, and so that came easily to him. Uh, So how he would have reacted in terms of the Cold War calculus of the time, I don't know. But certainly he was ill-disposed to India. Right. And I guess just to to a bit of a a tough transition, but I want to talk about you know, things that happened later on in, in India's history, sp- especially starting with the liberalization and how that sort of went awry. Your argument kind of centers on how India's liberalization led to concentration in a few industries like construction and finance and sort of skipped a lot of intermediate steps in sort of producing labor-intensive exports. So I want to get into your details of your thesis on how, I guess particularly under the Rajiv Gandhi um, when he was prime minister, uh, h- how this sort of came to be and, and why these industries in particular sort of build up that corruption that we were discussing? Well, so the, the, the light industries, it was not so much a matter of corruption, but the basic, the, the ingredients, the, the wherewithal was the problem. So this is, this is a, a little known historical fact and in some sense is a misleading fact, but in 1948, the share, India's share of global manufactured exports was a tad bit larger than Japan's. It's misleading because Japan was just going through a post-war re-establishment of its industrial prowess. It was in deep economic trouble and not not unreasonably, Japan quickly far exceeded India. But then in the late 50s, early 60s, and especially by the late 60s, Taiwan and Korea had occupied that space. Now the one thing that is common to all these countries, as is common to every country that is successful, economically successful since the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago, mass education and a serious effort at gender equality, bringing women into the workforce. The East Asian economies, starting with Japan, followed that playbook, and each one of them just basically copied the other. And that gave them, along with a competitive exchange rate, gave them foothold into global markets for labor-intensive products. And India missed out on that in entire process in the Nehru period and more to the point and more crucially and more irreversibly in the, in the Indira Gandhi years. Because by the end of the Mrs. Gandhi years in 1984-85, China was coming on stream. And the Rajiv Gandhi period, China basically st- was steamrolling. 
This is well before China became a member of the WTO in 2001. But by the late 80s and certainly by the early 90s, China had begun to dominate. The implication of this is that if buyers and suppliers internationally form long-term relations, and if you already have strong suppliers in this bunch of countries, you need a special incentive to go to yet another country. And India did not have either the human capital or the gender equality basis for that. And so it kept losing out repeatedly. Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and then the behemoth China. So on this, the the fault lies in the original concept of what industrialization in India would look like. And that concept having been embedded by Nehru no one was able to recalibrate it in a way that allowed for labor-intensive products. And then by the time of the early 1990s, Indian business had lost interest in manufacturing because by now, China had begun to sell into India. And so Indian manufacturers now were running scared of Chinese imports. And so they saw riches in finance and construction. That's how the finance and construction industries became the growth industries of of India. I see. And I guess speaking to the the sort of uh, manufacturing defects in in, in India's economy, there, there were a lot of publicly run companies to that point. You often, or you, you discuss Maruti, which is Sanjay Gandhi's pet project, was obviously a very corrupt enterprise. Um, so, so I want to get into how much these sort of massive conglomerates benefited from the the, the restrictions and then also in, in the aftermath of lib- liberalization, how uh, the privatization of these companies, um, you say, wasn't per- necessarily the, the right decision in, in some contexts. And I just want to get into that a little bit, too. Right. No, look, I, I very much, uh, you know, in this sense, I'm, I'm very much a World Bank IMF type in the sense that I have no, no brief for public sector enterprises. Mm-hmm. I'm not completely clear why... Uh, a public sector enterprise should be making generators or watches or uh, cars. Right. I mean, I think that's ridiculous. And so clearly the privatization of those was desirable. My my grouse, which holds to today, is that why should the Indian state be operating banks? Right. Banks, Mrs. Gandhi nationalized banks, as a political move in 1969 because she gave her the halo of being a socialist. And then those banks have become dens of corruption ever since, where the rich and privileged borrow and feel they don't have an obligation to repay. So I do believe in the the virtue of privatization with the appropriate regulatory safeguards. That said... The, the problem with the conglomerates, the Birlas and Tatas, were that they chose the easy industries. Uh, they had been built in, in, in an era of heavy industrialization. They fed those sectors. Uh, they had a little bit of uh, help. They did a little bit of consumer stuff like cars which they produced in protected markets. And they never really grew to be dynamic conglomerates like, for example, in Korea. They were very much, you know, what the economists in, in an earlier age would call satisficing. Yeah, we are making enough money. We don't need to, to uh, be sort of particularly ambitious. There was a lack of competition there, too, or is that kind of what? There was a lack of competition, exactly. There was a lack of competition both from international trade as well as domestically. That is what the liberalization of 1991 sought to correct. 
The one important thing about the liberalization of 1991, which people miss, is that it was contingent on a very sharp devaluation of the rupee. Once the rupee was devalued by about 20-odd percent, then the import restrictions became unnecessary because now the rupee is cheaper and therefore the imports are more expensive and therefore that's an import restriction without having to place import restriction. This was a message that Milton Friedman and his like-minded economists like B.R. Shinoy in India had been giving since 1957. Uh, it's just the, the stupidity of maintaining overvalued exchange rates had been ingrained and within a matter of three or four days after the, after the, de the large devaluation, the import restrictions largely went. And so did the export subsidies. They did not go altogether, but very largely, and that's the liberalization. The problem with the liberalization, as you rightly point out, is that it did not lead to manufacturing dynamism. There, there, is a, there is a huge fallacy. There was liberalization in 1991. There was GDP growth in the early 2000s. And people say that, that GDP growth was the result of liberalization. That frankly is complete bullshit. Because the liberalization was supposed to spur manufacturing dynamism, which it did not. What the liberalization did was it allowed a lawless financial sector and construction sector to grow. And that's the growth you see. The financial sector, I think, at the time of Rajiv Gandhi, was about 10 or 12 percent of GDP. Today it is about 22, 23 percent of GDP. That's where the large growth has occurred. And that growth both has been, and in, and in construction, the same thing. Not, so, not such a large increase in the GDP share, but a very large increase in the employment share. So employment has come through construction, GDP has come through finance. That's the liberalization. Hence, that liberalization, that growth is not really the consequence of what happened in 1991. In the meantime, the lag in human capital, in greater gender equality, inequality, has continued. And the inability to compete with China has become greater and greater with the passage of time. And so employment generation. The crucial thing here is, and you know, we started off with social norms, which is which was good. But from a purely economic point of view, the consistent failure from 1947 to today is the inability of the economy to create dignified jobs. And it is that lack which I think is ultimately the big failure. And... That lag, I am not able today to see how we are going to overcome it. And I particularly bristle when people talk about demographic dividend. Because demographic dividend is the idea that we have lots of people and therefore we will be a prosperous nation. But we have lots of people and we are not able to give them jobs. <laughs> so if we have lots of people and we are not able to give them jobs then we are going to create a socially unstable society which could go very badly. Right, and I guess speaking to the, the, the lag in human capital and investments in, in public welfare, education still is a massive problem in India as you write about, um, and especially the, the concept of universities churning out uh, useless degrees and and students kind of studying to pass exams and certifications without carrying benefits of that education into dignified jobs, um, which don't exist uh, for a lot of people. Um, so I, I want to get into more contemporary uh, education policy. We'll, we'll start with that and sorts of like wh what kinds of efforts have, have Indian politicians have tried? I know you write about the Right to Education Act, which 
obviously was not entirely successful. So, so why are recent efforts to catch up failing? And the short answer to that is education is difficult. You, you go back and ask why did India not, as a de- democratic society, invest more in education from day one. So in the book and in my teaching, I make a distinction between visible public goods and invisible public goods. This is a distinction that goes back, I think, at least to a book by uh, Jean Dres and Martisen. And the, the example they give is of famines and nutrition. So they say India has conquered famine, but has not been able to provide adequate nutrition. Uh, India is still, the, the, the metric of nutrition is the stunting of, of children. And India still has some of the worst metrics uh, on stunting. So why is it that we have dealt with famines? And their answer is because famines are visible. The press talks about them, the uh, politicians are accountable, but nutrition or the lack of nutrition more precisely is sort of slow violence against people and it acquires the character of creeping normalcy. Well, that's how things are, you know. And a lot of Indian uh, economists who are are cheerleaders of the system and apologize for it. So, oh, no, no, it's genetic and, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. That's, again, nonsense. The problem arises because there is a genuine lack of nutrition and a careful study showed that the gap in height is not applicable to firstborn sons, but is then applicable essentially to secondborn and thirdborn kids, especially girls. And you can see there that if it was genetics, then the firstborn would also be shorter. Uh, But that's not the case. So nutrition is not taken care of, and for the same reason, education is not. Because education is not one thing. Education is not setting up a school and bringing in a bunch of teachers and saying, teach. Education is getting good quality teachers, getting teachers to enjoy some respect in society. It is creating good neighborhoods so that kids are safe. Uh, It's creating a system of good health so that the kids can study. So education is hard work and there are no cheerleaders and no obvious champions who can claim, oh, I did this because it occurs over a long period of time. And therefore, it is something that gets flashy headlines every now and then, right to education or new economic policy. So there is a flashy moment where you make these announcements, but you don't then have any incentive to follow up and, 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 and create a system where, in fact, all these multiple ingredients come together to create an egalitarian education system. Right, and, and just to add, I, I think we see, in, especially in light of the COVID pandemic, that education is often childcare, that like it lets people... In, parents pursue labor and and when you have a dearth in education perhaps that's sort of cycling back into the women's labor participation rate right exactly exactly there's just too so many things that that good education good nutrition all of these things are hard work and their heroes are unsung The heroes being unsung is important because politicians don't like to do stuff where they are unsung. (laughs) Right, and and I just to transition into to like sort of the client clientele politics of of India and how that's kind of been a a through line across generations, across political parties. 
is education kind of fo- or the lack of education fostering that and in kind of inspiring the masses to be uncritical of their leaders would you say I, I would actually flip that and say so the ragurajan uh, who you may know of ragurajan was uh for some years the governor of the indian reserve bank when i knew him he was chief economist at the imf he was briefly my boss and he's a very distinguished academic at the university of chicago and raghu in 2008 had this brilliant uh, lecture that he delivered in india which had the theme of the venal politician and the idea of the venal politician was he deliberately did not give you the public goods that could make you stand on your own feet so so raghu's idea was that the venal politician deliberately kept his or her voters vulnerable so poor education poor nutrition bad housing inefficient water supplies pollution garbage landfills not being cleared up all that kept them vulnerable and so they would the the, the potential voter began to depend on the politician and that dependency created that client patron relationship where the politician was able to say okay fine don't worry about it i'll get your kid admission into school or guess what i will make sure that your wife gets admitted to such and such a hospital and therefore is able to be taken care of or i will make sure that you get allotted xyz and so that dependency creates the basis for granting favors and that granting of favors has now become a political art in india so recently the congress led uh, par- i think the congress party maybe in a coalition won the election in karnataka and what was their agenda free electricity so much elect free electricity every month free bus passes for women 2000 rupees a month for uh, women of a certain category i forget the exact categorization and that's become the competitive bidding now the next election they want to give more uh, people want to give more guarantees give free scooters give free bicycles all good i'm not saying don't do that but that is not a substitute that is not a substitute for the real problems a distressed agriculture poor urban job creation poor education a broken judicial system all areas that create the vulnerabilities that make the voter dependent on the politician yeah and i think that's sort of the crux of of your your problems with with the current um economic regime in India and I think it's quite interesting because none of those things appear in the GDP numbers that that get broadcasted in in the news and sort of in in the west we see a lot of narrative centered on that particular statistic which is not very attuned to issues of labor and and welfare so I just want to talk about GDP and and why that's been such a a, a popular statistic in India especially among the the political and economic elite and why that's such a driving force behind policy especially considering the fact that it doesn't really trickle down to uh the people you're describing so um you know soon after my book came out so in in the book i just made a statement saying that uh i am going to disregard gdp as a metric of citizen welfare and in in so doing i follow a very distinguished tradition which actually goes back <laughs> to 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 politicians robert kennedy very fam- had this very famous speech in in kansas in 1968 in which he said 
what does this animal GDP measure? Does it measure the quality of my children's education, the kind of health care that they get? And, you know, he had more poetic versions, the joy in their lives, which I guess he meant, you know, parks and neighborhoods and stuff like that. And then, of course, there's a very strong academic tradition associated with people like Angus Deaton and so on, who disregard uh, GDP as a metric. And so I felt very comfortable doing so. And now, in, in particular, the rampant environmental damage, which oddly enough actually gets added to GDP because the more more damage you do, you create GDP, but you're then leaving a poorer inheritance for your children. But the moment my, my book finished, there were these sporadic GDP numbers that came out that looked large. So I just recently wrote, wrote an op-ed for the first for Project Syndicate and then a more extensive one for the Hindu in which I said three things. One, a GDP-centric welfare measure is a bad idea. Two, the GDP-centric, uh, GDP itself has not really been growing rapidly. That if you look at the growth GDP growth process, the essential momentum of GDP growth of the early 2000s had faded well before COVID. And that the COVID numbers, you can't cherry pick the high growth numbers because COVID also had periods in which India did particularly poorly. And in averaging of the COVID period just before to now, or the period just before COVID gives a GDP growth rate of 3 or 4%, rather than these very fanciful numbers which range from 6 to 9%. So GDP is a bad idea. GDP, in fact, if you, if you look at it with a sober lens, has not been growing unless you choose, cherry pick the number. And the fact that GDP is not growing rapidly is completely consistent with the idea that if you do not have an, a well-employed, healthy, educated population, you will have weak demand. So India having 1.4 billion people does not mean that it's a large market. I mean, just to give you one number, there are 6 million uh, Netflix sub subscribers in India. 6 million out of 1.4 billion, okay? Yeah. So uh, there are probably 2 or 3 million iPhone uh, owners. There are probably 8 or 10 million people who order from a Swiggy and Zomato, the equivalents of DoorDash and Grubhub over here. So India is actually a very small market. Right. But, but if you are... And, you know, I, I, I call it the, the Thomas Friedman style of journalism. If you, if you come in like Thomas Friedman, go to the Infosys campus in Bangalore, and Nandan Nilikani there dazzles you with the latest technology in a, set in a California-style campus. Then you go out and write an email to your wife, Honey, the world is flat. And he writes this book, and... In that book, India becomes the center of the global economy. Yes, but those that's about 5 million people at the best, N not the 1.4 billion people that we are interested in. Right, and I mean, not to make this about me, but my parents are of Indian origin, and often our discussions sort of center on how India has changed since they were growing up and it's quite interesting like considering a lot of the discussion is centered on how quick it is to get from from Bangalore to Chennai but really that's only a certain fraction of the population who has a car to to drive that or to who can who can hire someone to drive it as another subsection so it's kind of these this like very privileged uh narrative in a way right yes yes and you know again the metros for example in the big cities and so the, the, the driving from intercity, intercity driving is a much bigger deal but the metros very nice metros but but you ask my father's driver 
who earned something in the range of 20,000 rupees, which for a driver's salary is much larger than what many other people give, plus various per perks. He does not want to, tra to travel in a metro if, uh, if he can travel by bus because the metro is much more expensive. So the the he, he, he was telling me a story about a neighbor of his who was suffering in 104 degree temperature uh, in a Delhi summer. And he says, why don't you buy a table fan? And the man is supposed to have answered, because I can't afford one. So the, the, we, we don't understand how many people in India are like that. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem also is that while we flash the GDP statistic, we don't give the distributional statistic. India has not conducted a consumption and poverty survey for the last 12 years. India does not conduct a census. So there is almost, as if you will, a deliberate effort to hide the fact that the distributional consequences of this high growth or allegedly high growth period have been extremely lopsided. Right, and I guess there's lots of disparities in terms of how the GDP is, is realized and, and how growth is realized in India. Um, but one kind of issue that I want to touch on is sort of regional difference and how different state governments have handled things differently because uh, despite its sort of perception of India as a, a unified nation, there's lots of different identities, whether it be religion, language. Um, and so in, in particular, South India has sort of got this reputation of having higher education and better treatment of, of its laborers and, and greater social welfare. Um, but in your book, you, you paint the picture that Tamil Nadu is actually in regressing towards a, the mean in, in terms of uh, Indian society. So I, I want to get into to that and what you think is going on in South India and just giving that the full picture there. Very important question. And, you know, one again that uh, took some effort to understand. For a very long time, Kerala, which is in the southwest, has stood out for extremely high human capital indicators, education, health. But people dismissed Kerala. Well, Kerala is Kerala. No one can replicate Kerala. And so Kerala as a model or an example, which I continue to think must be the model we must hold up has been disregarded in public policy as relevant for the rest of India. Tamil Nadu is a bigger state and there is a serious group of scholars who believe that Tamil Nadu shares some of the features that have made Kerala successful, namely the grassroots driven community activity that creates the political momentum and the political accountability for the delivery of public services. And you see that most evidently in the Tamil Nadu health services. Generally good quality uh, government hospitals, a relatively serious effort at primary health, that said, the reason I have this very dramatic statement in my book where I say, over time, Tamil Nadu is becoming more like Bihar rather than Bihar becoming more like Tamil Nadu, and this is what you quite rightly call the regression to the mean, is that Tamil Nadu has been infested by two evils which are common to the country. Number one, just stunning amounts of money in politics. Tamil Nadu in some ways pioneered this whole business of buying votes uh, during elections. And the amounts involved are just gargantuan. Uh, Jai Lalita, one of the former 
chief ministers was well known for this. Without going into uh, Jailalita's personal details, that phenomenon has become extremely deeply ingrained and is not going nowhere. The second, and this is much more corrosive, is the construction boom. As we have discussed uh, uh, a few minutes ago, construction is sort of the driver. Even, even in a state like Tamil Nadu, which has a reputation as an industrially, as a manufacturing-based state. The increase in employment there is not in manufacturing, it's in construction. Construction, as you know, worldwide comes associated with crime. Right. Uh, there's the New York Mafia, there's, mm -hmm. of course, the classical Italian Mafia, uh, Worldwide construction is associated with organized crime and it's no different in India. In addition, what, is in, what India has, which not every country has, is this business of illegal sand mining. So sand is an ingredient uh, that is used with cement to create concrete, a crucial ingredient therefore in construction. And there is very limited legal sand mining in India and so much of the sand mining is illegal and that has spawned perhaps the largest group of organized criminals in India and that is uniform. There is no this completely equal opportunity across the country including in Kerala. What is the implication of that? The implication of that is that those criminals then filter into politics and they filter into politics insidiously and you can see in the Tamil Nadu state legislature the share of uh, legislators charged with serious crimes like rape, extortion, murder, kidnapping has been steadily going up. It is still less than in Bihar but it's going up. And the Association for Democratic Reform that that maintains these statistics says that the share amongst legislators, amongst the ministers, is even greater than amongst legislators. Wow. I refuse to accept the notion that is that where the legislators and ministers are tainted by by violent crime, they are in the business of public policy and public welfare. Mm -hmm. That they are sort of they wear two hats, they make their money on the one side and they they commit uh, all these crimes and then they come and do good public policy. Uh, in that sense, the most grievous damage you see in Tamil Nadu is to the environment. Mm -hmm. The environment is the least talked about public policy issue in India, and the one with the largest damage. If I'm looking into the future, I'm saying, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just scared about how much damage we have done to the environment. Not just, the most talked about uh, damage is to the air. No, the most, most severe damage is to the rivers. Virtually every river in India is dying. Mm. And Tamil Nadu is no exception. The roads that your parents and me and all of us so uh, are so enthused about, they are extremely environmentally damaging. I'm not saying therefore don't build roads, but what I am saying is be conscious that you are doing it in a way that is compromising the future and therefore take the appropriate safeguards. There's a coastal highway in, in Tamil Nadu that is going to create, that, that has been written as a case study mm. of, of the, the, the violence you can do to the environment. And this is happening at a time of climate change right. where, where sea erosion is occurring, uh, sorry, the coastal erosion is occurring, sea waters are coming in closer into the, into the coast. We are setting up an environmental disaster and Tamil Nadu 
is almost a leading on the leading edge of that disaster in the south of course the north the himalayas which we if you are interested i can give you a discourse <laughs> on <laughs> right and i mean the the issue of climate change in india is something that is rarely as you mentioned rarely discussed but i i want to get into that too and just how like why there's such a lack of discussion in that in the political spheres and how that issue is sort of perceived among both politicians and also people and the, the commoners in India. So how, how do you reckon with this issue of climate change? And you allude to the fact that it could disproportionately affect certain amounts of certain sections of people in India. Okay. I am I'm very grateful to you for giving me this opportunity because this is, this is, I think, I think that if there is any hope that someday somebody will wake up, it's when we have a, a climate crisis. You know, um, there are serious people who think that the world's first major climate crisis will occur in India. Mm. Because India is, pro India is subject to all of the ill effects of the climate crisis. Heat waves, melting glaciers, uh, 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 coastal erosion, every every such uh, problem. There's a history of uh, environmental disaster in India that's quite astonishing. Okay, so exactly, exactly. If you have already damaged the environment, then the climate crisis acts as a multiplier. Right. So the interaction between the climate crisis and uh, and <laughs> environmental damage is explosive, and we have set ourselves up for it. Mm. Okay. So let's take one example. One case study, I recently, uh, well, while writing my book, I read a book by a, a very brilliant uh, Mumbai-based journalist, Kavita Iyer, called Landscapes of Loss. This is set up in Marathwada, which is a part of Maharashtra. And recently, I had her in my class through Zoom, talk to the class about Marathwada. So... Maratwada went through a period, and I'm not going to give you the exact dates, but approximately between 2016 and 2019, almost four years of consecutive droughts. Then I think in 2021, it had excessive rain. And again in 2023, it seems to be not as severe, but also a drought. So the, the signature of the climate crisis is extreme weather events. So either you have very poor rainfall or you have excess rainfall. And excess rainfall is also bad for the crops. So we've, Maratwada has gone through almost seven or eight years of consecutive crop losses for different reasons. Water tables have declined. At the same time, people always, you know, the, 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 the cheerleaders of India always forget that about 50% of the workforce derives its income from agriculture. We don't even see them. They're not a part of our calculus. So, Kavita told this story, which is was reported four or five days ago, of a farmer who had committed suicide. That young man had a law degree. Wow. A, a, an advanced law degree. Now, here is here. This is this is a case study of the general phenomenon I'm describing of lack of jobs and the garbage uh, degree awarding institutions. That this man has put in the effort and the expense to get this certification, which is worthless. He comes back to the farm. He's unable to earn a living and he commits suicide. So in that one, st in that one statistic, you see 
a drought prone area subject to climate change where people are trying to get ahead through education but not succeeding and the agricultural sector being unforgiving and that is how a third of indians live wow uh maybe more so so the climate change in agriculture is going to ha- have a very severe effect particularly if groundwater levels continue to decline climate change on the coasts another statistic which is startling is kerala for example again i forget the exact number has lost something like a quarter of its beaches wow that's yeah why does that happen because the the science i don't understand but there are currents that take the sand away and currents that replenish the sands and if you build concrete structures along the coast in a way that the sands that are supposed to return do not you lose the sand you lose the mm-hmm. beaches you don't just lose the beaches you lose livelihoods right uh, again there's a book very recent book and i'm, I'm forgetting <laughs> the author's name who has dis- who fo- who who visited those areas repeatedly over the last 10 15 years and she has described a process by which every year the 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 coastline has come in and how families who lived uh, uh, alongside the water have gradually disappeared because there's they don't the the sea has come into their homes and they have lost their livelihoods that is climate change that's sort of a graphic understanding and then the himalayas i'll say one last thing about the himalayas himalayas is a catastrophe extraordinary amount of overbuilding going on mm. reckless overbuilding going on on mountains that are young and therefore fragile that's the environmental damage we have inflicted now you add to that the melting glaciers the debris that that begins to get loose when the glaciers melt that debris comes down the mountain sides and in and an on an already decapitated terrain causes vast damage. Right. Yeah, and I guess one part I want to address about climate change is sort of like what are current policy or or what what's the kind of consensus on this and if there is any and, and why is it so you know why is it such a like ignored concept to uh address climate and i guess you can say that of of the world in general but in particular in india why is this not coming to the to the limelight so in india all the sort of you know well known public intellectuals have converged on a furious debate on what should be india's net zero date so net zero is this concept when a nation delivers net zero carbon into the atmosphere. Mm. Now, here is the irony about this. They rightly argue that look, we have not been responsible for all this carbon in the in the environment or in the atmosphere. We need to we need to develop. Therefore, you need to give us a break mm. and therefore we should be allowed to pollute for longer. and that's the debate they are engaged in okay mm. i have paid limited attention to that debate because yes it's a legitimate debate and you can have it and you should have it but that's sort of the visible part of climate change the invisible part is what i'm talking about the droughts in marathwada the falling ground water tables the encroaching sea the change in the typhoon pattern so that 
the there are more typhoons now in the Arabian Sea and the kinds of damage they are likely to do to large cities like Mumbai. The there there is oh yeah 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 we 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 are taking care of it we are we are we are dealing with uh, uh, we are creating advanced warning systems no no please you need to stop this violent construction you need to be mindful for example recently this is this is a real life policy example the new prime minister decided, new not 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 so new anymore, <laughs> that he wanted to build a major highway called the Chardham Highway. Chardham is four shrines. There are four major shrines in the Himalayas, and a beautiful expressway that will take you all the way to those shrines. The environmental groups lobbied hard enough that the Supreme Court said, well, there should be an inquiry as to the desirability of this highway. The inquiry was led by a noted environmentalist, Ravi Chopra. Uh, for full disclosure, Ravi is a very dear friend of mine. The Ravi Chopra committee report said, Okay, you want to build a highway, build it. But don't don't be silly. Don't build this, you know, such a wide highway. Because if you do that, you're going to cut into the hillsides and you're going to create permanent damage. So Ravi was essentially marginalized and he resigned because the government said, no, 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 we need it for security reasons because that's the road that's going to take the troops to some, uh, to the Chinese border or whatever. And Supreme Court just backed off at that point. So, okay, well, security, we have not, we, we have no, <laughs> no views on that. Therefore, let the government do what it wants. That highway, that construction, two things. One, the landslides have already begun. As a consequence, as Ravi exactly predicted, you build this highway and you will not be able to use it because it will be unusable from the large parts of the year. And exactly that's happening. That Badrinath Highway is closed for long stretches of time. So dealing with climate change, oddly enough, in the Indian context, is not doing stupid things. Right. Climate conscious policy. Climate conscious policy. It is not just a matter of advance warning. Oh, well, there's going to be uh, three days or t- 10 days of very high temperature. Okay, fine. Do that too. But climate conscious construction policy, climate con- uh, conscious water policy, how to maintain and preserve them, not just for this generation for successive generations. If we don't do that and we keep building large dams and glitzy, shiny highways and flyovers, we might look briefly very dynamic, but we are leaving an infinitely poorer inheritance for our children. Right, and and on that note, I, I, I just want to underscore how important it is for for such discussion, and I'm glad we're able to, to have it, um, considering, as you mentioned, the lack thereof. So just shifting gears a little bit, I, I want to get into sort of the, the current government and especially issues maybe dating towards the pandemic and since then. Um, so in, in your analysis, you kind of highlight the vast inequalities caused by the pandemic and, and how certain figures have, have benefited from the COVID era policy and, and just the inequality that has, a, has sort of developed since then. And I, I want to ask how that's changed since in the last couple of years and how have these inequalities continue to, to grow and, and what's the sense there in, in terms of India's pandemic recovery? Okay, so this actually has a very complicated answer. The fundamental, during the COVID, 
period. As is true of any na natural or unnatural catastrophe, the poor, the vulnerable suffer the most. Climate, droughts, pandemic, because they have the least safety net. You know, the, the rich Indians were taking chartered flights out of India, uh, paying mind-bogglingly large sums to get out before the, the Brits and the Middle Eastern countries closed their doors to, to Indian chartered flights. So there was that natural process of inequality creation, or sort of amplification rather than creation. That obviously stops once the catastrophe goes away. There was another another feature during that period because stuff became more popular online, both within India and globally. Some of the Indian IT companies, and in particular the so-called startups, did very well. That also created a certain degree of inequality, but the, the point over there is that it created a sense, it also created a false sense of celebration that Indian startups, uh, you know, got so many thousand starts up, startups and so many of these are unicorns and the account became a, a sort of a metric to signal that India was now an emerging technological power. That has changed and in quite a dramatic way. Here's what happened. That, that I gave you some statistics on the online use. Netflix, iPhones, food delivery, there were all kinds of, oh, ed tech, uh, uh, medical uh, tech, agri tech. And somehow the concept was that technology will become a substitute for basic human and social failures. In the last year particularly, but the last two or three years, with global interest rates rising, there has been a squeeze on the venture capital funding and there has been a growing realization amongst venture capitalists that 1.4 billion people is not the Indian market. Mm -hmm. That the Indian market is about maybe the size is somewhere in the range of 30 to 50 million people at the extremes, but of that there is a core maybe of 15 or 20 who are regular users of online services. The result is that Indian tech is going through a winter which is greater than the winter that, that is being experienced for similar reasons in the rest of the world. In other words, this online surge is at the excessive recruitment that occurred during that surge in the West happened in India, but the retrenchment in India is happening at a more rapid pace. Many people who were extrapolating from the COVID era, era period into infinity are now going to have to reassess. Yes, India is a more important player, marginally so than before, but is this the future, which is going to be a substitute for all the deficiencies that we have talked about in manufacturing, in education, health, etc., the the most well-known of the ed tech companies, Baiju's, had a valuation of something like 22 and a half billion, maybe in early to 2022, or its valuation now is somewhere in the range of five to seven billion. And that is a very common uh, markdown for a lot of the Indian startups.
And yes, there is more stuff coming out. And yes, there is going to be entrepreneurship, which is not going to disappear. Uh, and there always remains the possibility. But as an engine of growth, I think anybody who claims that that is going to continue is uh, is not being realistic. I see. And I guess just using that to transition towards the future a little bit. And uh-huh. I, I know your book is more of an analysis and an economic history rather than a policy manual. But of, of course, you have your own opinions on how how India should move forward. And, and I just want to get into to those and what, what you think are steps to that could potentially rectify, or if at all, any of the uh, the sort of gaps in human capital and, and social welfare and, and climate and all these areas that we've discussed. Yes, so so when when we reach this stage of the discussion of my book, even some of my sympathetic readers get annoyed and say, well, okay, so tell us what to do. <laughs> and my answer to that is, that there is no mystery to what we need to do. Just the latest example we were talking about, climate conscious policies. I'm not an expert on what climate conscious means, but I know that you should not be doing stupid things like building roads uh, uh, which are uh, large, which are going to destroy the Himalayas. I know you should not be building coastal highways Uh, at a time when this is unreasonable. I know that we need to deal to create better strategies for water conservation. And there are a million good ideas. I know that education needs a long-haul effort, as does nutrition. The reason I do not go the next step and say, okay, here are five things you need to do, is that my basic analysis says that the core problem lies not in knowing what we can and cannot do or should and should not do. The core problem lies in implementing those incentives. It's the bad equilibrium, right? That's the bad equilibrium. That's the bad equilibrium. That is if, for example, come back to the Maharashtra example. The Maharashtra policy, the Maratwada policy, specifically said, no, no uh, wells, store the water in tanks. What happens? People say, okay, we get to store the water in tanks, but you know what? It's easiest to dig the water out of the, the earth and put them into the tanks. So some people started digging the water out, and then there was a race. It's the same story ad nauseum. Why is there poor teacher quality? Everybody knows the answer to that. It's because you need teacher certification. Teacher certification is awarded by fly-by-night colleges and institutes set up by politicians and notables. And here's the bad equilibrium. They pay a bribe to some regulatory authority to get the license to award those degrees. The teachers pay a large fee to get the certification and then the teachers pay somebody else to get a prized job in a government school. And by now, everybody has paid everybody else. So where exactly are you going to break the cycle? Mm -hmm. Same story repeats. We know that sand mining, illegal sand mining, is corrosive not just to the environment, not just to agriculture, not just to biodiversity, but to the political culture of our country. The Supreme Court has made a number of decisions saying illegal mining has to stop. Who enforces that? Is anyone interested in enforcing that? <laughs> the, 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 the 
what am I trying to say, Neil? What I'm trying to say is, it's not that we don't know what needs to be done. And therefore, if I say, my, my first policy is stop illegal sand mining, you would be justified in laughing at me because, yeah, we know that. We not only know that there are, there are Supreme Court decisions which say don't do it. There's a Supreme Court committee that says don't build Chardham road so wide. There are Supreme Court decisions or there are, there are engineers who say that Joshimat, which is a town in the Himalayas, is sinking and therefore don't construct over there uh, without extremely specific studies to make sure of the geological stability of those areas. Yet we do it. Why, why does Bangalore get flooded when there is a modest amount of rain? Because we have, we have closed all the water bodies. We, we have, we have, Bangalore's lakes have disappeared. Lakes have disappeared in Mumbai. What is the mystery over here? What am I supposed to say? Recreate those lakes? What, so the, the policy measure is not what to do. It's everybody knows what is to be done. The policy measure is that there is a bad equilibrium in which political accountability is lost. And the reason it's a bad equilibrium or a catch-22 is that unaccountable politicians do not impose accountability on themselves. Mm -hmm. And they are the only ones who can impose that accountability. Therefore, you have to find a political process by which you rebuild those norms and accountability. Right, and I think I just want to bring in something really quickly. Um, so there's this, like, I guess this Arendtian thought that there's like two models of revolutions, the American and the French, and how the American model is deeply distrustful of government, whereas the French wants to use government to to kind of, you know, in, instill the, the revolutionary principles. And I, I think it was Professor Pr Professor Prakash in, in one of my classes, um, Jan Prakash, he, he uh, talked about how post-colonial countries tended to obs like observe the French model and, and sort of utilize government and, and its powers. Um, so is it a question of like political philosophy and general sentiment and as to why um, there's not this skepticism towards politicians and their bright ideas who end up meeting the same mistakes and sort of reinforcing the bad equilibrium, as you call it? Well, look, I... I, I cannot visualize a, a, a civilized society without an important role for the government. So I'm not, I'm not going to go down the path that your question is opening up. I think what, what you need to go back to is where does government succeed? And government succeeds where it is closer to the people. So what has happened over a period of time is that populations have become larger and so this concept of representative democracy, which is which takes the, the politician further and further away from the voter. I think where, where government succeeds is where there is decentralized authority. And this is why I come back to Kerala. So Kerala has had a tradition of decentralized government. And decentralized government essentially allows for greater proximity between the voter and the political leader. And in such systems, not just in Kerala, but worldwide, the general evidence is, not always, and people are going to, scholars will tell you that such systems are also susceptible to being hijacked. But in general, there is better quality public goods provision 
there is greater accountability, there is greater trust and cooperation. And it is rebuilding that trust and cooperation that is needed for long haul efforts like nutrition and education and the environment. That is what decentralized government allows for. And my hope, indeed my prayer would be, that India develops a lot of that Kerala style decentralized governments, the successful part of the Kerala style decentralized governments, such that there is a ground level re-establishment of accountability and then that process filters up into the state and national governments. It's a very idealistic vision and a very somebody might some people might say unrealistic vision but my difficulty Neil is that if this does not happen I do not see a way out of the bad equilibrium and I, I want to use that thought to maybe segue into what you might answer for this last question is what we ask all of our guests and the name of our podcast is Policy Punchline, despite it being a long-form podcast. We like our guests to, to end on a, on a note of some kind, whether it be an axiom, a adv- piece of advice, or something you find relevant, perhaps something that summarizes the, the interview we just had. And So I'm just curious what your punchline would be for, for this episode. Right, my punchline would be rebuild social norms and public accountability as the foundation for a fair and just society that also delivers material progress. All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Modi, for coming on the show. This was a wonderful discussion, and I was very happy to to speak with you today. Thank you very much, Neil. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.